be joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are here to provide everyone an update on all things COVID-19 across the state of Maine for today, Thursday, October 1st, 2020. We begin today's briefing on a somber note. The Maine Center for Disease Control is reporting the passing of the 142nd individual with COVID-19 across the state. He was a man in his 50s from York County. As we always do, we offer his friends, family, and community our deepest condolences during this time of their grief. Right now across the state, there are a total of 5,431 total cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 40 cases since yesterday. Of those cases, 4,865 are confirmed, an increase of 41, and 566 are probable, a decrease of one case. Cumulatively, 451 individuals have been hospitalized, and right now in the state, 12 people are in the hospital with COVID-19, two of whom are in the ICU and one of whom is on a ventilator. For context, that makes Maine's rate of hospitalization right now approximately one person for every 100,000. The national rate of hospitalization in the United States remains at nine people for every 100,000 across the country. As I mentioned a moment ago, sadly, there have been 142 individuals who have passed away and 4,704 who have recovered, an increase of 26 from yesterday. Among our cases are 100, well, I'm sorry, 1,062 healthcare workers. I'd like to take a second to provide a little bit of context around the case increases that we've seen in the past two days and indeed over the past two weeks. Many of you will have noticed that just in the past two days, we've logged more, we've logged 94 additional cases of COVID-19. I'd like to take a slightly larger step back and take a look at trends that we've observed in cases over the past two weeks. Just in the past two weeks in Maine, we've logged 488 new COVID-19 cases. To put that number in perspective, 9%, 9% of all of the cumulative cases of COVID-19 in the state of Maine have occurred just in the past two weeks. The average age of individuals diagnosed in the past two weeks is 40. Back in March, April, and May, however, the average age was 51. What that means is that in recent weeks, younger individuals in Maine are being affected by COVID-19. That's concerning partly because they are younger individuals, but also because as we've seen from data from the US CDC, increases of COVID-19 among younger individuals precede later increases of COVID-19 among older individuals. So the decrease in the average age of new cases in more recent weeks is a concerning sign for us. Also of concern is the geographic spread of COVID-19. In the last two weeks, we have had new cases in all of Maine's 16 counties, but we don't have outbreaks in all 16 cases. So what we are seeing is the continual spread of COVID-19, particularly in parts of the state where previously there had been fewer cases. To put that number in perspective, of the 488 new cases in the past two weeks, 412 are not associated with any known outbreaks. That is to say, only 76 of the 488 cases are known to be associated with an outbreak. To be sure, that may change as our investigations continue, but as of right now, the majority of cases in the last two weeks are not associated with any known outbreaks. Rather, they are associated 
with transmission that is spreading and occurring in every part of Maine, from person to person, from family to family. We've of course talked about our heightened concern for York County. Indeed, of these 488 new cases across the state in the last two weeks, 194 of those are from York County. 40% of all cases in the last two weeks are from York County, which by comparison accounts for 15% of Maine's population, but yet generated 40% of the new cases in the past two weeks. And right now, there are 17 open outbreak investigations in, in York County alone. That's more than half of all of the open outbreak investigations in which Maine CDC has been engaged. York remains the area of highest concern, but it is not the only place of concern. We've had, as I mentioned, new cases across the state in a number of counties where there were previously fewer cases. Just in the past two weeks, we have had eight new cases in Lincoln County, five new cases in Penobscot County, two each in Somerset and Waldo County, in Aroostook County, two cases, and one case each in Hancock, Piscataquis, and Washington counties, where previously there had been few cases in those counties, we are now starting to see an uptick. Now, to be sure, we are actively looking for more cases of COVID-19, primarily through our expanded testing in a number of fronts. There are swab and send sites across the state of Maine. We are also working with long-term care facilities, nursing homes across the state of Maine to make sure that they are testing their staff on a regular, frequent, and recurring basis. And so, as we've talked about before, in public health, when you go looking for things, you find them. And in this case, it is true that some of the increase in the cases that I've mentioned is directly linked to our proactive efforts to go forth and find cases through things like open swab and sends, an expanded standing order that allows anyone in the state over the age of 12 months to get tested. And then the swab and send sites that allow you a place to get tested, as well as the proactive surveillance sentinel searching for cases in nursing facility employees. All of those things contribute to our ability to get a better vista, a viewpoint into what's going on with COVID-19. So although this case rise is, is concerning, it's also one that we planned would occur as we set our for ourselves forth in, in undertaking expanded testing. But that doesn't reduce the risk. The concern here overall is that even though we anticipated finding new cases because we set out to look for them, what this tells us is what we suspected all along, which is that the virus is in every part of the state and that each and every one of us is potentially vulnerable to it. I'd like to turn now to provide an update on some of the outbreaks in which Maine CDC is working on. I'd like to start with an epidemiological investigation into a cluster of cases associated with woodland pulp in the Baileyville area. Right now, there are a total of seven cases associated with that facility. This is among individuals from a variety of different states. One of those individuals is from Maine, another from Louisiana, and five individuals from the state of New York. The reason I mention this is that this is an example of that sort of proactive testing. Individuals had been screened, they were found to have been positive, and further screening was done. I'd like to just take a second to thank the Callis Regional Hospital as well as the St. Croix Regional Family Health Center for stepping up and partnering with us to provide testing for everyone at the Woodland Pub Center. Indeed, the Callis Regional Hospital served as one of the state-sponsored swab and send sites. It's because of their efforts already being on the ground that we were able to mobilize quick and available testing 
so that we could get a better sense of who was potentially affected there. Again, this is right now a cluster of cases, and we're, we're, we're further analyzing the test results. As we have additional information, we'll make sure we report that to everybody. I'd like to turn next to some open outbreaks that Maine CDC has been working on. At the Sanford High School, there are now a total of 18 cases. As I've mentioned, we conducted two days of testing and over 900 individuals associated with Sanford High School got tested. Through that process, we detected a total of three cases. At Massabesic Middle School, there are now a total of eight cases associated with that middle school. We are similarly working with that middle school to provide for testing for all potentially exposed close contacts. That is to say students, teachers, and staff members there. That testing will occur during two time periods. One is this evening, and then the other is on Saturday morning. If you have questions on how to access that testing, if you are a member of that group of close contacts, please reach out to the middle school and they will have further information on how you can avail yourselves of that testing. Next up also in York County is the Pinnacle Healthcare Facility, where there are a total of 13 cases, eight residents, four staff, and one family member of one of the staff members. And finally, at the ND Paper Mill, where there are now a total of 24 cases, ND Paper is working to arrange another round of universal testing for all employees next week. That will give us a better insight into what's going on there and whether there has been any subsequent transmission. We have not yet seen it. We have not seen an increase in cases, but this is the one, this is the reason why we do repeated rounds of testing to characterize and understand whether there has been transmission of COVID-19 from the original group to further and further circles. Before I turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew, I just wanted to close on a quick personal note. On Tuesday, I asked everyone to go out and get their flu shot. And I wanted to make sure I was following my own advice. So yesterday, I stopped by a pharmacy in my town and got my flu shot. I'm proud to say and pleased to say it took only about three or four minutes. I was in and out before I knew it. And after I got my flu shot, I was able to walk out knowing that I had done one of the best things that I could do to help keep not just me, but everyone around me safe this winter. By getting my flu shot, I not only reduce my chances of getting the flu, but I also reduce the chances of people around me getting the flu from me if I may not have known I had it. And so I'd like to just take another moment to ask everyone to go out and get their flu shot. Now, we all know it's getting colder. As my friend Ned used to say, winter is coming. Poor guy lost his head over that. But as we go into the colder months, this onset of winter has raises two concerns from a public health perspective. The first is that we are going to be facing the onset not just of COVID-19, but also influenza on top of that. Both of those diseases on their own can be deadly, but the possibility that we could be grappling with both poses extra challenges, not just to healthcare providers, but to all of us. Both diseases can be a risk as we go into the winter months. And that's why getting the flu shot is a way to reduce your risk at least for one of those two things. But the other reason that winter is concerning is that many of us will be going back indoors more. And as we do that, we will lose the protective effect of being outdoors, the UV light, the better ventilation, the natural spacing that can come with being outdoors. And we'll start moving a lot of social activities indoors where we might be closer together, where there's not UV light and where windows are closed which removes that circulation and ventilation. That means there's a higher risk of both COVID-19 as well as influenza. But again, you've got steps that you can take to keep you and your family safe. In addition to spacing out even when you're inside and wearing face coverings when you've got friends or family visiting indoors, you can also take your family to go get a flu shot. It's one of the safest ways to keep that bubble that we've all talked about 
as impenetrable, impenetrable as possible as we go into the winter months. So with that, uh, I'm sorry, one last thing before I turn it over to Commissioner Wambrew, and that is an update on some testing metrics, a few testing metrics to provide. Let's start with the positivity rate. Right now in Maine, our seven day positivity rate is 0.49%. For context, the national positivity rate right now is 5%. The rate in Maine is 0.49%. Finally, a note on testing volume. Our testing volume in Maine is 459 tests being conducted for every 100,000 people. To put that number in perspective, the national rate right now is approximately 250 tests for every 100,000 people. The rate of testing in Maine is about 459 per 100,000. And finally, an update on testing numbers among individuals from out of state. Overall, in the state of Maine, there have been approximately 10,600 individuals who listed their address as being out of state who have gotten a COVID-19 test in Maine, 10,600. Of those 10,600 individuals, 271 have received a positive result. In fact, I apologize, everyone. I, I got that wrong. Apologies for that. There have been 10,600 tests among individuals who have listed their address as out of state. Many people can get tested more than once. So 10,600 tests among individuals from out of state. And of those, there have been 271 positive tests among those folks. Again, bearing in mind that many people can get tested multiple times for work, before medical procedures, or on their doctor's orders. So again, apologies for getting that incorrect. Of 10,600 tests, there have been 271 positive tests among, uh, among individuals who listed their residents as being out of state. So with that, I would now like to hand things over to Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. In Maine and across the country, COVID-19 has struck residents and staff at congregate care settings particularly hard. As such, I am excited to announce today that Maine will invest nearly $1 million from the Federal Coronavirus Relief Fund to support infection prevention and control in congregate care settings in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This tailored clinical consultation will reduce the risk of infections among Maine people who are highly susceptible to this virus and improve consistency in infection prevention and control in these settings. The funding will support non-nursing home congregate care settings, including but not limited to group homes, assisted living facilities, adult family care homes, memory care homes, and private non-medical institutions. More than 10,000 Maine people live in these settings, many with underlying health conditions that place them at greater risk for COVID-19. That is why since the beginning of the pandemic, this department has conducted outreach to these 600 sites. In fact, since uh, the beginning of COVID-19, 63% of the 105 COVID-19 outbreaks closed in Maine were in non-nursing home congregate settings. So we have been working with these facilities since the beginning. Through a survey early on, we found that a wide range of knowledge, practices, and resources exist in these sites. Many of these settings lack a nurse or other clinical professional train who are trained in infection control, and few have infection control plans since unlike nursing facilities, there is no requirement to have one. So the department is contracting with home health organizations that will dispatch nurses and other healthcare professionals to congregate care settings across the state. This consultation includes on-site reviews of policies and practices, interviews with staff and residents, development of an infection prevention and control plan, and follow-up support. 
This will help facilities prepare for new infection control regulations that the department intends to adopt by early 2020 to help reduce outbreaks in congregate care settings over the long term. This expert consultation builds upon the Mills Administration's support for congregate care settings as well as nursing facilities. As Governor Mills stated, this investment will enable us to support these homes so that staff can have the training and resources they need to help keep their residents healthy amidst the ongoing pandemic. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Shaw for questions. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we will turn to our colleagues over in the media. And the first question today goes to Bob Evans from New Center. Good afternoon, both of you. Um, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner, you're welcome to uh, chime in if you'd like. Maine Senators Susan Collins and Angus King are trying uh, to get the Trump administration to ease restrictions on travel to and from Canada. They say that the transmission of COVID-19 over the border remains low. So they would like them to reevaluate the ongoing restrictions currently placed on non-essential travel across the border. What is your opinion on opening up our border with Canada again? I'll begin by saying that we have always in Maine had a great relationship with the provinces that surround us. Many of our residents work in Canada and vice versa. And in fact, in the situation that Dr. Shaw just talked about in Calais, we know a lot of people come back and forth on a daily basis for essential work um, in this pandemic. But generally, they have been great neighbors and partners in all of our public health as well as our economic activity. Our policy here in Maine has been to look at other destinations, COVID prevalence, look at their quantitative and qualitative data to see if they travel to and from these places would pose greater risks to people in Maine. There are certainly areas of Canada where they would not pose, travel to and from those places would not pose uh, the kind of risks that we have been worried about previously. All that said, even from those places, we welcome visitors who can quarantine or get a te negative test result to um, visit and enjoy Maine. But this is more of a matter of international diplomacy, so I will leave this to the governor. Agreed. Um, we will turn next to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, I have a question for you and for uh, Commissioner Lambrew. Commissioner, I'll, I'll start with you if you don't mind. The million dollars you just talked about, can you explain to us how that uh, will work? Will there be a number of people consulting with these congregate care facilities and when will they get there, things of that nature? How does, how does that exactly work? Yeah, so we have opened up um, this option to help provide this specific kind of infection prevention control and training to these sites, to different organizations. I believe we're ready to go as soon as this week. We really have been aggressive in trying to move out on this, just knowing that, as Dr. Shaw mentioned earlier, we always run the risk of having an uptick in cases and putting people at risk. So we are lining up the help. This is a voluntary activity for group homes, so we will be communicating with them to also line them up so we can really deploy these nurses and other clinicians as soon as possible to them. Like all the coronavirus relief funds, it has to be spent by the end of the year, so this is a very aggressive project that we want to undertake. But we feel confident that this assistance that we'll be providing through this federal funding will set up our group homes to succeed. We want them to be able to adopt these practices for the long term so that this one-time help will lead to long-term gains. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Shaw, a question for you. Um, the Eastern Area Agency on Aging shared, uh, I think it's something from the FTC. It's about um, the elderly population possibly being the target of some scams, people saying that they're contact uh, tracers. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who receives a call like this? If the, a, a contact tracer did call them, how could they identify that it actually was the real deal? Sure. So, Brian, let me start by um, noting that if someone's got concerns over the validity of the person who's calling them about whether they are really, truly a contact tracer, the best thing to do is to, is to ask for a callback number, is to say, you know what, I just want to make sure I know what's going on. And so ask for a callback number. And if when you call the, and then check to make sure that that number in the phone book or more nowadays, of course, on Google is actually the number for the main CDC. And if you're not able to get that, if you're not able to have somebody give you a number 
that says, yep, you can call the main CDC hotline or the switchboard and they'll transfer you right back to me, that's a red flag. The second red flag is if a phone number, a phone call comes in. And one of the things that we've done to try to allay this fear, Brian, is to work with the phone companies so that when a contact tracer calls, especially if they're calling a landline, but nowadays even an, uh, an LED phone that has caller ID, it will say main CDC on it. So that's another check that can be used to see whether the person who's calling is actually a contact tracer. The third potential red flag is if the contact tracer is asking personal information, especially financial information. Main CDC contact tracers are not going to be asking about bank records or things of that nature. What we will ask about is your name and your date of birth. We don't ask about resident, we don't ask about citizenship, we don't ask for social security numbers, and we most certainly do not ask for anything related to your finances. So if there are concerns, the best thing to do is to say, thank you for your call. I'd like to just call the main CDC switchboard and get transferred back to you. And if they're not able to give you that information, there is a concern that it could be a fraudulent call. Thank you both. I'm gonna turn now to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I just want to clarify, make sure I understood you correctly. Did you say the number of new cases at ND Paper is 40? Oh, uh, or the total no. number of cases, I mean. The total number of cases at ND Paper is 24. Okay, thanks. I'm glad mm -hmm. I double checked. Yep. I have a couple of questions from listeners. The first one is uh, one asked about face masks or face shields in addition to face masks, or are they if they fit properly and cover adequately, can they be a substitution for face masks? Um, face shields, the sort of piece of unified plastic that goes down below your chin and back to your ears, can be worn in conjunction with a face covering but they are a, a very, very, very distant substitute for a face covering. Because even though they seemingly cover one's eyes, they can still allow for droplets to be transmitted underneath the face shield itself. We recommend that wherever possible, a face covering be used. A face shield is something, but it is a distant, it's a distant second. Okay, great. and. You've mentioned that here in Maine, decisions are made based, have been made all along based on science, not any political pressure. One of the listeners wanted to know if, despite the fact that that's how you've been operating, has there been any actual political pressure from DC, perhaps on reopening or any efforts to influence directly state policy? From the Maine CDC angle, the answer is a no. Okay, great, thank you. You bet. Uh, Joe Lawler at the Press Herald is up next. Um, yes, hi, I have a couple questions. Um, uh, first question is uh, the main DOE uh, told me today that um, they're going to be having like a centralized website where you can get um, information on school outbreaks and school cases. Um, it, do you know, uh, when that might occur and um, what the main CDC's involvement is in that? Um, in, in terms of the when, Joe, I, we are working with them. I, I don't know what the launch date on that is, but I know that it is underway or it's under construction. Uh, main CDC's involvement will, with that piece of the website, let, let me first start by saying there already is a website uh, and much of the information around education, education policy, co uh, county color designations, much of that information exists on that website already. My understanding is that the dashboard that you noted will be a new addition to that existing website. Main CDC's portion of that will be to furnish the data that we have available on the number of cases in schools and where and, and any outbreaks that we're working on tracking. Uh, Commissioner? Yep, I was just gonna add that it is the Maine Department of Education website. They have their framework that document that's there. And the first part is all about public health. It is your one-stop shop for all information related to requirements for schools, recommendations for schools, the health guidance that we have, it's all in that one spot. That's where this dashboard will be posted hopefully soon. 
Okay, thank you. And my follow-up question is, well, it's kind of a two-parter, but um, just to, to clarify, it, because a lot of these cases are not um, associated with outbreaks, um, is that an indication of community spread? And then also, um, it, are you finding a greater percentage of cases asymptomatic versus symptomatic compared to uh, prior to the testing expansion from a few months ago? And, and if so, um, is that... Um, it, is there any takeaways from that? Okay, uh, as to the former question, Joe, what, what it really tells us is that, it, it, it tells us that we are diagnosing more individuals, um, but the way that case investigations work is that we receive word of a positive case, and after that case has been notified by their health provider of their diagnosis, Maine CDC gives them a ring. We try to do that within the same day. Um, and we ask a series of we, we ask a series of detailed questions, and those questions are designed to, as we've talked about, to try to get a sense of where they got COVID from and who they may have given it to. The where they got it from questions, the upstream questions, are where we ask about potential associations with other known outbreaks. What what these data tell us is that because the increasing percentage of cases that are not associated with an outbreak because that's been growing. Um, I don't know that it's evidence per se of greater community transmission. A lot of it is just greater transmission in areas that aren't linked to outbreaks. But it, that doesn't mean they won't be because as our investigation proceeds, we might learn that they are. But based on where we are right now, it does suggest that we're detecting more individuals before we're able to link them to outbreaks. That may eventually turn out to be pure community transmission, but that usually takes us a few weeks before we've ruled out every other possibility. Um, and then in terms of the asymptomatic piece, Joe, uh, we haven't seen significant changes in the percentage of people who are diagnosed symptomatically versus asymptomatically in the past 12 weeks or so, which is when, uh, 10 weeks maybe, which is when we first did the first expanded testing with IDEX. Uh, again, initially, nationwide, most folks who were tested were those with symptoms. But Maine was in the vanguard of saying, we want to test everybody who is asymptomatic. We were among the first states to move toward that. And as a result of that very early move, the percentage of individuals whom we diagnose who are symptomatic or asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis hasn't really changed appreciably. Again, that's more a function of how early we went to expanded testing for folks like close contacts. Uh, so that, that's, it's just more because we were one of the first movers there. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Evan Pop at the main beacon. Hi, Dr. Shadow. Um, can you share the latest notes on the racial disparity of COVID cases in Maine and uh, what steps uh, Maine CDC is um, taking to address that disparity? Sure, Evan. Uh, the racial and ethnic disparities underlying the cases of COVID-19 uh, that we've got in the state uh, continue to be extremely troubling and uh, categorically unacceptable. Um, for, since we first recognized that there was this disparity and this sadly ever-widening gulf, we started taking aggressive steps to try to mitigate that. And I, 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 I'll start and then would invite Commissioner Lambrew as well um, at, at the main CDC side, we started focusing on three key areas. Uh, the first, of course, is prevention. Working with it, it groups across the state of Maine to make sure that the best available information around protecting your family from COVID-19 was not just available, but available in their language, for example. So translation around prevention materials, things of that sort. Another key aspect of prevention was working with on the ground community-based organizations to equip them, to empower them to work with their communities, to answer questions, to furnish face coverings, things of that sort. Second aspect was around expanded testing and to make sure that testing was available and accessible in a manner that worked for those who are members of those communities. And then the third is around the follow-up to testing. That is to say, case investigation and contact tracing. We at the Maine CDC have taken deliberate steps to hire case investigators and contact tracers 
who are fluent in languages that are commonly spoken in Maine. So that when we call and somebody says, and one of the questions we ask, I should say, is do you have a preferred language that you would like to communicate in? And if that preferred language is not the language of the person who's calling, we try to make sure we have people on staff who the case can be transferred to, who can interact with that individual in the language of their choice. We also are working to provide social supports because we do know that take, take being in isolation and being in quarantine is not easy. It is especially hard if you no, don't necessarily speak the same language as the people are trying to help you. If you are part of a community that you don't trust people outside of your community because of historical problems. So we provided $1 million in a health equity improvement initiative to organizations that are led by or run by people of color, people with different ethnicities, et cetera. So we are working to implement that program. We also have recognized that we need to um, engage with our healthcare community to make sure that at the site of care, people understand cultural differences, are able to broach those divides and begin to provide the type of cult culturally appropriate care that people need to get to be able to respond and succeed the way that other people do for COVID-19. And um, I'm sort of wondering like what the, the trend line of the racial disparity is. Has it, um, has that disparity shrunk at all since um, the summer when it was reported that Maine had the highest racial disparity in the country for COVID-19 cases? It's, it has changed, Evan. It's changed kind of over time as the ebb and flow of cases overall in the state of change. It's also changed county by county. Um, it, it, we've seen increases, for example, back in uh, uh, early August uh, among individuals uh, who identified as being part of the Latinx community. So it's ebbed and flowed considerably. The latest information is on our website. That would be the best place to get the latest. Okay. And I will just add that we did, we had done aggressive work with um, people who come to the state for, for example, the blueberry picking season or other sort of migrant farm workers, which often tend to be people of different races and ethnicities. Working with Maine Mobile and other partners, we've been able to aggressively test and isolate and quarantine people. So, so far, we've had a very successful effort at really trying to make sure that we're doing extra work to make sure that people coming to the state who may otherwise be vulnerable get the type of help that they need. Thank you. Next up is uh, Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I've got another question about the increase in new cases that aren't connected to outbreaks. Can you point to any other reason why we're seeing an increase in those cases? I mean, are, are they connected to maybe, you know, Labor Day activities or schools reopening or is, are you seeing any patterns or trends? Uh, that, that is, that's a question. It's a great question, Patty. It's one that we've talked about at our epidemiology meetings. Uh, as of right now, we haven't seen any direct linkages to groups of Labor Day activities. That is to say, we haven't identified outbreaks that emanated from Labor Day gatherings or things of that nature. That doesn't mean that they aren't out there. Um, but as a result of that, it's difficult on an individual level to say, aha, this one person is likely to have contracted COVID-19 because of that exact barbecue that they went to on Labor Day. We hypothesize that Labor Day activities played a role in the increase that we saw over the last two weeks. But as a scientific matter, uh, I, I don't have definitive proof of that, but that is part of the hypothesis. Uh, Patty, I think the other question though is, even though that, it, that some things like Labor Day would be consistent with the story, the question is whether that is the entire story. And that's what our epidemiologists and the disease detectives are trying to determine. Were there other events, large gatherings or other otherwise, that could have also contributed to spread? Or on the alternative side, is what we are seeing the beginning of greater and greater levels of community spread that are irrespective of things like gatherings? That's a question our epidemiologists are trying to sort through. Um, given that the data that I just shared are literally the last 14 days, it might take a little bit more data to try to get a better sense of what's going on with the virus and the transmission. And then can you also um, 
explain a little bit? I mean, we're seeing our positivity rate is looking, you know, pretty good, but right. then cases are going up. Um, so it sort of seems to be telling these two different stories. You know, some of the data is concerning, uh, some of it isn't. So how do we make sense of the yeah. situation? Yeah, it looks, it kind of, on first glance, it looks like it's pointing in a bunch of different directions. So let me, let me make two quick observations, Patty. The first is, and I think a really important one, which is the increase in cases that we've seen, the events of, say, the August 7th Millinocket wedding, those events and, and the increases have not derailed Maine's progress. We are still making progress against COVID-19. I am concerned, however, that that progress could backslide or, or be undone in certain ways. But we are making progress and the events of the past two months haven't derailed that, but that is the risk. Uh, well, the way to reconcile many of these, Patty, is to look not just at positivity rate in new cases, but also the increase in the volume of testing. So throughout the month of September alone, just in the month of September, we at the state of the state of Maine increased the volume of testing of COVID-19 testing by 38% just in the month of September. So that's one reason that some of the increase in new cases that we are seeing is a, is a function of increased testing. And indeed, the amount of testing that we did outstripped the number of new cases, which is why we were able to keep the positivity rate not going up, but in fact going down. We started the month of September with a positivity rate of 0.60%. And we ended the month of September with a positivity rate of 0.48%. So even though the rate went down, we detected more cases. All of that from an epidemiological perspective tells us that we're doing more testing, we're doing more testing in more parts of the state, and we're capturing cases that would have otherwise been left undiagnosed. But it also tells us that the virus is in all parts of the state and that the risk, the vulnerability to all of us is still there. Thanks. I have one really quick question, if you don't mind. The Woodland Pulp um, cluster, I just want to double check that as a cluster and not an outbreak at this point. That, that's right. And, and that's really more of a term of art, Patty, to be completely candid with you. Um, it, it has to do with the fact that we are just confirming with some of the other states to make sure that the reports of confirmed cases that we've gotten are in fact confirmed cases. And we, this is a scientific venture. We don't wanna take someone's word for it. We wanna see the test results ourselves or have a confirmed email from another state health department that says, yes, these individuals have indeed tested positive. Once we've crossed that threshold, it will become more of an outbreak, but that, that is really more of a term of art. It does not impact at all our intervention steps. We are treating it as if it, as if those cases were in fact confirmed. We're not waiting around to say, well, let's not do anything until we hear back from that other state health department. We're still arranging for testing. We're still doing contact tracing. We're still putting mitigation and isolation measures in place. We're not waiting on that at all. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn next to Charlie at the BDN. Yep. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, uh, my first question is about uh, a, a tip we got from a reader today that uh, there may be three or so cases of COVID uh, at a different ND paper mill in Old Town. Um, can you confirm whether there have been any positive cases identified with that facility and if there's any kind of outbreak investigation happening? Uh, Charlie, we, we have not opened any outbreak investigations at any other ND paper facilities other than the one that has been open in Runford. Okay. Uh, and then uh, my other question is about the August, the um, wedding outbreak in the Millinocket region. Specifically, uh, it's about the Millinocket region where um, cases seem to have really dropped off. I don't think there's been a new case in, in a few of the towns up there for at least a month. Uh, and just wondering if you have any thoughts on why it has kind of gotten under control up there, whereas the sort of secondary outbreak down in York County uh, and now what 
whatever community transmission is associated with that, why that's kind of out of control or growing, whereas in Millinocket, it is, uh, you know, kind of dropped off majorly. Yeah, Charlie, that's a, a good question. It's a, it comes down to a couple of things. The first is by reports that I've received anecdotally by email and then in speaking with others, once the events uh, associated with the, with the wedding became more widely known in and around Millinocket, uh, folks in that area, not just in that town, but adjacent towns, really took it seriously. Uh, businesses closed, town halls closed, schools closed. They put a clamp on things in such a fashion to reduce any further transmission. That I think is one of the biggest reasons. The second is that the number of individuals affected in and around Millinocket from the wedding was not that high. That's evidenced by the fact that many of the attendees at the wedding were not necessarily from that town, from either Millinocket or East Millinocket, but from elsewhere in Maine. And then the third reason, of course, has to do with things like population density. York County being a naturally higher population density area, more opportunities for one person who may have gone back to work or home in York County to infect a wider array of people as opposed to someone in the Millinocket region. So I think it boils down to those three things. An immediate action by folks in and around the area to close businesses, wear face coverings. The fact that many of the attendees at the wedding were not necessarily from that area. And then factors like population density. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna turn now to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Hello, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, so you mentioned you mentioned earlier that uh, that the, uh, the the age of of persons uh, contracting coronavirus is trending downward at the moment. Um, could you talk a little bit more about when that uh, when that trend started, and um, is it is it possible that that's connected to the reopening of uh, colleges and schools and things like that? In the state, or is it? Uh, is are there other factors at play there? I'm, I'm glad you raised that, Patrick. It's probably not so much related to colleges, but let me let me give you the data first. From March through the end of May, so from March 1st through the end of May, the median age of all COVID-19 cases in the state at that time was 51.3. From June 1st through the end of September. The median age of all cases in the state of Maine was 41.4. So it dropped from 51.3 from March, April, May to 41.4 in June, uh, June, July, August, and September. Just in the past two weeks, it's dropped even further to 40. Um, so that gives you a sense of the time period that we're talking about. It's the early set of cases, the first phase versus the latter phase. Uh, there are a couple of quick observations I'll make, uh, or not the latter phase, the current phase. A couple of quick observations. The, the initial phase, March, April, May, was characterized by a number of notable and sad outbreaks at congregate living facilities, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, et cetera, uh, which of course generally have an older population in them. Uh, as more PPE and infection control practices have been adopted by those facilities, Outbreaks of that nature have thankfully been more rare. They still occur, but less commonly. That's one factor. The other factor is that there's been a resumption of economic and social activity, especially among younger individuals. That's one reason the average age has been driving it, has been driven down recently. The concern, however, when the Sun Belt reopened was that the that this drop in median age was then seen a couple weeks later by an increase of cases among older individuals as folks visited with their grandparents and such things. So that's a little bit more uh, detail on where that is. Is it related to colleges? Uh, it, it's, it's possible, Patrick, but the number, of college, the number of cases on college and university campuses that we've had uh, is, is, a, is but a fraction of the total number of cases since say August 1st. Okay, thank you very much. And the final question of the afternoon goes to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thanks so much for taking my question. So just two questions today. So the first is an ABC News article was published last night saying that 
the U.S. CDC stopped releasing guidance from September 24th to the 30th. And then a source close to ABC said that scientists are actually prevented from updating the new information. Is this something that could impact the main CDC and also just the country's progress on the virus? Yeah, Allison, I can't speculate on how that reporting, if, if true, would impact us. Uh, but here, here's what I will tell you. Here's how we make decisions at the main CDC on scientific matters. When we've got, we, 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 keep on, we keep very much on top of the evolving scientific literature, what's in journal articles that's being published. We also just go directly to the scientists at the CDC when we've got questions. Uh, the guidance documents they publish are helpful and instructive, but when we've got a question, when we want to know what the latest data on a particular issue are, my team and I just pick up the phone and call the lines, the scientists there themselves. So I can't speculate on whether this might have an impact nationwide, but the way we analyze questions in Maine is that we go to the literature itself, and when we've got questions on that, we just pick up the phone and go straight to the experts at the CDC rather than waiting for them to publish something on their website. Uh, again, can't speculate, uh, haven't, haven't seen the report, haven't seen verification of the extent to which it might be true, but we just go straight to the scientific sources. Okay, great. And then my last question is the Little Lamb Learning Center and any updates on that outbreak and what was the timeline of that outbreak? Um, the Little Lambs Learning Center right now has a total of 12 confirmed cases of COVID-19 associated with it. Uh, as I mentioned uh, the other day, they voluntarily closed uh, now over two weeks ago. Um, and I believe that we are working with them to chart their next steps as, as is the Office of Child and Family Services. Um, I can get you the exact dates of the timeline of when those first cases were identified. Uh, I, but right now they have, they've got 12 cases. And again, uh, they have, uh, we're working with them as they talk about their plans for reopening, having gone through at least one full incubation period. So we can get you the additional data on the timeline. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much. Commissioner Wambrew, any, any closing words on your end? Sure, I'll just repeat what you said at the end of your closing remarks, which is the importance of everyone getting a flu shot. I got my flu shot. It is free to anybody with insurance. And it's also important for parents to make sure that their children get the full range of vaccinations. That's the way we really can go into this winter, not only protecting ourselves against these diseases that we know, but also preparing for the eventuality that there hopefully will be a COVID-19 vaccine. And us preparing now to get flu shots, to get childhood vaccines, prepare the state of Maine for that next important step. Thank Great. you, Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Commissioner Lambrew, and thank you all for joining in and joining us this afternoon. We hope everyone has a great day. As always, please be kind, take care of one another. We'll talk again next week.